that makes the urgent need to pay more attention on poverty problem and poverty reduction effort while not leaving while not leaving the issues or rural uh, poverty because it's actually interrelated but more uh, attention and more focus should be given into the uh, solving the urban poverty problem so in light of these needs uh, this study seeks a better under uh, Needs. Uh, SMERO, uh, commissioned by Ford Foundation, uh, conducted a study in 2011 uh, which seeks a better understanding on the connection between spatial planning and urban poverty reduction. Basically, we want to know whether is there any connection between the spatial uh, planning and poverty reduction. How the uh, the city growth uh, can actually hamper, whether it's actually hamper or actually supporting the poverty reduction effort. Uh, we have two uh, main use of question is the how urban planning including generative urban planning address urban poverty and the second one is to to what extent the urban planning is inclusive to the poverty problem in the area, whether it's actually answer the needs of the poor of the city. So. In terms of on doing so, uh, the study has two objectives. Because it is producing an urban poverty profile based on the spatial location. We'll go to just later on. So there are rationale on the study site selection based on the spatial context and typology of livelihood. And the second one is generally a map of key institutional actors. So we see the actors involved in uh, spatial and poverty reduction planning in city uh, of Surakarta and Makassar. Uh, so we see the interrelation between between those two. Okay, now I'm going to go through the framework used in this study. Uh, this study implies the sustainable livelihood framework uh, developed by the FID. Basically, this sustainable uh, framework puts uh, basically it categorizes the livelihood assets of the poor into five types of capital: the financial capital, which is basically the access to credits, access to uh, financial resources, access to financial systems; human capital, which is basically the education, health, and so on. Uh, physical capital is the, well, we can say physical, but it's actually also infrastructure capital. How the infrastructure in their settlement, let's say, uh, uh, they have access to it. Uh, natural capital is land, water, uh, uh, yeah, uh, land, access to land, and social capital. Uh, it's the condition of these assets of the poor is influenced and shaped by the vulnerability context, which is basically the shock, strength, and personal security. And this vulnerability context is, in turn, shaped and influenced by the policies and institutional process in the city. Uh, that is the government uh, uh, program policy, and so on and so forth. So the, the flow of the presentation today will follow this flow, which we first will talk about the asset, asset condition of the poor, and then we'll go to the vulnerability context of the poor, and then we'll see how the uh, policy and institutional actually support or hamper uh, the, the vulnerability uh, and, uh, and the asset condition of the poor. Okay, so... I'll go briefly in the city profile. This is in Malaysia. And the first one is in Surakarta. It's a large city, 500,000 uh, 500, people with a substantial rate of poverty. It's about 14, 15% rate of poverty, but substantial. While the other one is Makassar, the metropolitan city, because it's about it's 1 million uh, people. With, uh, a quite low poverty rate, 5.6%. So the, this two city was selected uh, with the basic rationale of Western and Eastern uh, comparison, uh, West, East, uh, Eastern and Western Indonesian uh, comparison. And also because of the, the success 
of this is this two city in implementing quite an innovative uh, uh, social protection scheme. As we know in uh, Surakarta under uh, Jokowi, they have made some breakthrough uh, policies on uh, poverty reduction, while in Makassar they also have a good track record on poverty reduction in recent years. So this two uh, uh, city will be the uh, site of the uh, the study. Uh, in on determining the research location, you see that in uh, Surakarta, three kilograms is chosen in each of the city and is chosen based on its spatial context. As we can see here, there are three main spatial contexts that we that we use in the study. The first one is the inner city, uh, basically the inner city slum, the slum that are in the middle of the uh, uh, the city, and then uh, the Kurahan that are in the riverbank or coastal area, because Surabata doesn't have coastal area, so we choose the riverbank area, and the plenty urban area. So the rationale of this selection is basically the assumption that the poverty condition of the inner city is actually different with the condition with the poverty in Peri-Urban. They, they each have their own uh, problem, they each have their own vulnerability, they each they have own asset condition. Now, so this differences that we want to see because uh, Property reduction uh, policies right now is just a blank policy. They treat the poor as the same wherever they are. But actually it's not, because they, they face their own uh, vulnerability and they have their own asset condition. So uh, in this instance, this will be our main approach point, the spatial context. The same goes with Makassar, one in inner city, uh, one in the coastal area, it's Kalurahan uh, which most people work as the fisherman, uh, the small time fisher, fisherman, and the other one is in the very urban uh, Okay, <clears throat> so we've uh, talked about the background, the framework, and also the, the study side. Now let's get on to the first part of the analysis, which is the livelihood assets, the condition of livelihood assets of the poor. Based on the S, uh, SL, the Sustainable Life of the Framework, there are several uh, key trends to search for the five types of capital as we already discussed before. The first one is human capital, that using participatory method basically ask them to uh, write the score on how you, you how, how much uh, asset you have on this uh, human capital, and they, they rank quite low in every study site uh, in terms of education and attainment. However, in terms of health, uh, there are actually quite an improvement, they say, because now with youngest and youngest mass, with many local government now employ youngest as one of their policy, uh, flagship policy, they actually they can be quite helping, but uh, as we, shall see, as we shall see later, that improvement in health care and uh, health care services does not necessarily reduce the health shock uh, they face if they fall sick. Later on, we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, so the trend is basically it's good, so it's improving. In natural capital, it's uh, very low. Uh, it's very low in coastal and riverbank area because the, the people who live in coastal area, they rely on the shore uh, in the coastal fisheries. While the coastal fisheries is now heavily polluted and it's overfished and it's degraded. So the return from fisheries dwindling in a very, very fast rate. Uh, and it's also lower in the inner city area as a result of high density. Basically, they don't have more space left to improve, they want to make infrastructure or, uh, or improvement, they don't have any more. So it's also considered low in the inner city area. However, a little, uh, slightly different, it's slightly, slightly higher uh, asset is found in the peri-urban area because they have still have uh, relatively higher access to land 
because land is cheaper and there's still uh, considerably more land open for them to have uh, backyard farming and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, it's slightly higher than per urban area, but overall, it's, uh, it's, it's, the trend is getting, uh, it's worsening. And financial capital is generally low in our area, as we know, as, and it doesn't matter where, it's low, and, but especially uh, on the coastal area, because in coastal area, uh, who works at, mostly work as a fisherman, uh, they need constant capital. If they want to go to sea, they need uh, money for fuel, money for bait, money for uh, provisions when, when they are out in the sea. So a substantial amount of capital is needed every time they want to go out. But with their very low return, they are not considered bankable by the formal uh, uh, financial uh, institutions. So they basically go on to the money lender uh, or loan sharks and actually we really deteriorating there as a base in the long run. So financial capital low, even lower in the coastal area. So the condition is also uh, worsening. And physical capital, there are actually a marked improvement in uh, the community level uh, infrastructure such as road, uh, lightning, and uh, also uh, water services. But Thanks to also marking by the NPM program, it's actually worth. It's actually there are some uh, uh, there are some evidence in the in the in the site that uh, they made some empty uh, public toilets and so on and so forth. However, it's still concentrated in a relatively well-off area, while the the poor concentrated area you see left out. So in this term, in physical capital, there are there's stagnant. There are no mark or worsening. There. And social capital is more consistently high in all areas. However, uh, it's, if you see the Pentagon, it's actually marking higher than the rest of the capital. But it, it, it's understandable because, as we, as I mentioned before, when they need capital, they the first the first order they do is to lend to neighbor. They, they borrow money to neighbor and they borrow money to acquaintances or... Uh, so basically social capital here serves as a form of social safety net. They, they, they use it as a social safety net. However, one cautious note is that mainly also because of the result of normative answer. Because there are some taboo for some people to say that here they, you know, the relationship is not good and so uh, and there are conflict and uh, the relationship uh, People are fighting each other. Some some people say that things are taboo. So everyone say that okay, it's good. Everything is good. And also, it's also include the negative kind of negative social capital, as we shall see uh, later on, uh, because uh, in form of wedding ceremony and the, the other where they have obligation to help. And when they come to the wedding ceremony, they have to give money also, right, to, to contribute. And the, the amount is quite substantial, it's 100,000 uh, per wedding. And in uh, wedding season, can, there can be like three to four weddings a uh, uh, month. So substantial will come from there. And whoever does not give, because they actually put the number on the envelope, so they know who gives, how, how much. So this kind of negative social capital we will talk later on. Okay, so uh, here we go to the asset. Putting it in a spatial perspective, there are no actually significant differences on human, physical, and social capital across spatial contexts. We can see that the coastal, inner city, and peri-urban. Uh, there are no marked different. Uh, low social, uh, high social capital has happened everywhere. Low human uh, educational attainment is also low in everywhere, so it's impacting everybody equally. However, the difference is in the natural capital again, where the where the people in the coastal and the riverbank area who face higher risk. Uh, because then the, right, the, the riverbank, they face higher risk of flooding because the uh, soil is no, known as prone to flooding. You know, a little bit of rain and it's already flooding. So 
hit markedly uh, lower in the coastal and the riverbank area because of the risk. <coughs> and also the financial capital, as I mentioned before, also very, very low on the coastal area because low productivity on fisheries submitting assets to financial institutions. So as we can see here, there are some differences between the spatial context of the urban poor. So this will uh, this, this is one of the key message on this uh, study. Uh, uh, the, the poor in this area and that area is not facing the same problem. They basically have their own problem. Okay, so we've talked about the assets. We have talked about the asset and spatial uh, and spatial uh, approach. So let's go to the second part of the analysis, is, which is the vulnerability context. For every context, basically, what's the difficulty they face each day on um, improving and doing their livelihood. So, based on the framework, there are several key vulnerability. There are several type of vulnerability. First one is trend. It's basically the vulnerability as a result of changing condition, like urbanization and so forth. Uh, and then the seasonality, the vulnerability caused by seasonality, is the vulnerability that has cyclical, cyclical period and somewhat can be predicted actually, like uh, rainy season, you know, uh, dry season, they actually cyclical and can be predicted, should be predicted. And the other one is shocks, vulnerability that comes suddenly and unpredicted. And this one can have life changing effect. So as we can see that uh, from the study area, we can see that the trend is uh, mostly on the unpredicted uh, uh, season uh, because especially the, for the people who live in the coastal area, they say that lately we cannot predict weather anymore. Usually for the fishermen, they actually can predict that, okay, in one year there are three months or four months that we cannot go to sea because it's, uh, the, 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 the weather is bad, so it's dangerous, so we cannot go to sea, and the catch is also uh, very low. But now, actually, uh, during the study, they already not going to sea, they haven't gone to sea for about six months, or seven months, because uh, extended rainy period. So this also brings attention to the question of uh, climate change, that say that uh, climate change is more impacting people in the rural area than the urban area, but that's not true. Because for the poor, also for the street vendor, the street vendor who have a cart in a street, whenever it's raining, they self-spawned it. So uh, this kind of things also miss out in the policy discussion uh, on climate change. Because climate change is actually impacting the same of the rural poor and the urban poor, same. Price, uh, price increase in inflation and degradation of natural resources, also uh, basically diminishing the livelihood assets. Basically, they okay, we, we have more money now, but the money value less because of the inflation. And they are they they uh, they say that we don't know how the future will bring. They they see they they feel that things are getting worse and worse. That that are really actually very significant on lowering their well-being in terms of well-being and uh, quality of life. So one of the, one interesting point is that one of the most uh, readily uh, one of the highest. Uh, rated answer in when we ask about the consequences of poverty is simple, stress. And when they say stress, they say it results on uh, household violence, and uh, uh, domestic violence, and it's related to the health condition, and so on and so forth. So the stress itself should be not taken lightly because uh, if poverty can take physical toll, but also a mental toll, and, and that one is uh, the one that are less uh, uh, touch now in policy discourses. The second uh, vulnerability is the seasonality uh, uh, vulnerability, as I said before, the rainy season, unpredictable weather, and also on the holiday season, because during the Laban, you see, usually there are some uh, pattern of uh, household financial condition. 
they save a whole year and then they spend it all during the bara and then they start from zero again and then they save again and then they spend it again. So uh, and there are some some well I don't know I mean like maybe it's that the, for the you know time for them to release you know to feel a part of the community and to feel a part that I can still celebrate something so we cannot blame them 100. Uh, uh, also the wedding season, as I also mentioned before, it's like uh, before the wedding they have to help uh, to pre prepare the wedding and because they have to prepare the wedding they cannot work. Well, they actually their income is actually on a daily basis so when they help they cannot, they cannot work and they cannot get their daily income and when they actually attend the wedding they have, still have to uh, contribute. So uh, it's very different. New school year also, even though there are no tuition fee, the out-of-pocket cost is actually still high because there are many charges. There's uniform, there are many transportation charges and everything. So this still contributes uh, uh, significantly to its vulnerability. It's prohibited as an accumulation and earning their asset base. Shocks. Well, in global financial crisis in 2008, especially in Solo because uh, Solo is a service city and they are mostly uh, trading, <laughs> uh, focusing on trade and many poor people actually work on the market. So when the economic downturn strikes, the market are a little bit slower and they also have the impact on them also. There are also shops like fire, eviction, relocation and so forth and uh, major level shops, it's the sickness. Uh, let's get back to the sickness. I uh, said that they are improvement on the services. So basically they can they don't have to pay anymore. But actually the transaction cost of being sick is still high because uh, if the kid's sick, he has they have to attend the kids and they cannot they lose one day of work, say. And they have also have to pay the transportation cost on going to, uh, to the hospital. And also one of the one of the most, uh, they say, one of the highest spending is on the uh, cost on uh, when, when they're renting on the hospital because they have to eat outside and they have to, and if it's they, if they hospitalize, uh, they have to do that for one, two, three days. They don't work and they expand, uh, the expenses uh, rise quite enormously. So this is also one of the, uh, one tiny detail that are not really uh, Visible before, but it's very, very significant for them, and can result in destruction of life in assets. Putting it in again in spatial vulnerability, uh, as we can see again, that natural resources. There are several uh, key vulnerability risk factor. Even though like many good illegalities still also happens in inner city and urban, but. Mostly, also, this happened mostly in the coastal uh, river bed area. And also, one of the main uh, feature of the coastal and river bed area is the lack of sanitation and uh, water infrastructure. Because basically, for water, uh, they cannot use uh, digging a regular well. Because regular well only grows like 20 meters maybe. And it's salt, still salty and it's, um, uh, cannot consume, it cannot be consumed. While at the same time, the piping network usually still excludes the, the periphery areas. So the only uh, choices is basically they buy from people who can afford to build an artesian well, the one that goes about 100 meters down. That's, that's where the water is. But that even not sustainable because it sucks groundwater in such a way that it, I can result in uh, soil degradation and uh, erosion. Uh, for inner city, fire hazard is a big problem. I mean, like, they are, like, very tight together. One, one uh, uh, house set fire and it's just, like, going everywhere. Uh, like, a public space also, like, in case of uh, solo, they really need public space for, for their kids to play. So basically they play in the railroad track. So because the railroad track is quite open, so they play in the railroad track. But they, don't, they already know in, uh, during the afternoon they're no longer train passing by, so they 
they take quite safe, but they still play the railroad track, which is not really uh, suitable. And the third urban area, most of the risk is that they mostly, the poor mostly lives in illegal subdivisions. So, you know, in terms of the generic security, and because of the the growth, the in, um, uncontrollable growth on the illegal subdivision, the land is not serviceable. It's not serviced by the government. Basically, there are no uh, electricity, uh, there are no water system, and there are no garbage disposal system. Everything they have to arrange it themselves. So basically, in several subdivisions, they have their own system to provide them with those basic essential necessities. Okay. Mm, yeah, this is the this is the example of the social map that we create there. Uh, the red one represents where the house, uh, where the poor is, and in this two area, the one that we uh, highlight here is here is the private owned land, but uh, now serves as an illegal subdivision. And people are renting around, and this was once an uh, animal slaughterhouse. So for some reason, in here, in the middle of the complex, in the middle of this land, there are huge piles of bones. Uh, uh, yeah, piles of, uh, I think it's cow bones. And some of them actually still have flies in it, and it very, very, like, represent a very, very significant health rate. Uh, plus, there are no sanitation services here, there are no uh, septic tank whatsoever, there are no clean water services, there are no electricity, they have electricity but they actually have made an illegal connection. Uh, so, yeah, so this is one of the illegal areas. Yeah, here is also an illegal area, but uh, they are standing in the public land, uh, the government's uh, own. Uh, the other part of this is that along this along this road, the main road, there are substantial substantial number of uh, chicken slaughterhouse, which uh, basically they don't have dedicated uh, uh, sanitation uh, system. So, yeah, in the gutter there are many guts, uh, chicken guts, chicken skins, or whatever. So, and so it's. Uh, that actually represent also a uh, high, uh, uh, high health rate. And let's consider there's a breakout of avian flu. I think this area will be very, very in trouble. So maybe it's, a, it's not really you know matter right now. It's only a chicken. It's only a chicken slaughterhouse. What's the difference? But when the avian flu hits, well, we will be. It will be in very big trouble. The other one, also the same in uh, Surakarta, we, uh, we have two uh, pocket of poverty that we have the social uh, uh, social uh, poverty map. And this one is in the bank of the river. This is the Malawasul River and some of them are still living here. And they are actually, during the rainy season, uh, the, the Plot that are like 70 meter high is actually okay. That's not considered flat. But flat for them is if this goes here or their house disappeared, then that's flat. <laughs> because it's very, very common. It's a very regular occurrence that, you know, flat, yeah, it's only 40 centimeters. No big deal. We can still work, we can still do that. So. <laughs> okay, so. Seeing that vulnerability, they must do something about it, right? So, in this part, we talk about how they cope with this, how they cope with those vulnerabilities. And there are several coping strategies, like we say, coping with seasonal vulnerability, coping with unpredicted shocks, and coping with spatial, spatial vulnerability. Okay, so first one is coping with seasonal vulnerability. In coping with seasonal vulnerability, the poor mostly cope by reducing household expenses, taking side jobs uh, for uh, supplementing their income, and the one who works usually is the, the female household, and the children. And the children who work, also there are several instances that I met that the one that works is usually the female 
children, the screamer children, uh, because they are, they pay less and they can be uh, uh, used as the put out in putting out system and so forth, so forth. So uh, they use this strategy to supplement their income, even though. The seasonal vulnerability is mostly become very unpredictable, uh, unpredictable right now because with more and more shocks, with more and more crisis also. Second one is coping with unpredicted shocks. On doing so, a coping with prediction shock, the poor mostly resort to selling their asset and borrow money from acquaintances or friends. Or if that's not enough or fail, they go to money lender and loan shark. But as we can see from this list, actually, all the option is not sustainable in the long, long run. So basically, the poor need on cash is not necessarily that they cannot pay back, but it's the timeliness that they need because they have they have courage uh, to borrow from loan shark. Even with the loan shark, we really charge a high interest rate, but that's not that that doesn't matter for them because they know that somehow I will pay this. But the one that they need the most is when they need it, they have it. So this is one of the key features of the uh, that's still lagging on the formal uh, financial institution because they, if they go to formal financial financial institutions, they need the money now and they they still have to arrange this matter, and they this document, that document, this collateral, and that document. So it's not very. Uh, uh, beneficial for them to go to the uh, formal infor uh, formal financial uh, uh, institution. And while in coping with spatial vulnerability, it's even less so uh, option for them. <laughs> well, some people in the flood prone area can create attic and build attic, but mostly they say, what if there's fire? What if there's flood? What if there's you are affected? How, uh, if you are relocated? Nothing we can do. We can do anything. So this actually highlights that the spatial vulnerability is actually very, very significant in their likelihood. Because an other vulnerability, they, they can do something about it. It's hard, but they can do something about it. But on spatial vulnerability, the impact is really very overreaching and very, very violent effect on their likelihood that they cannot do anything. So this is the responsibility lies on the government, on the on the on, on the, the provider of the services for them to help them coping with special vulnerability because they cannot do anything. The other one, hard, but they can navigate. But this one, if you lose your house uh, because of fire, if you lose your house because of eviction, nothing you can do. So. This brings again the importance of the spatial issues of property in urban context. Okay, now we move to the final part of the, uh, the analysis, which is the institutional analysis of the spatial, uh, spatial planning and property reduction. So, First, we go to the local institution. Using the Fan diagram, there are several key uh, institutions that are considered as vital. And you can see that the bump detail here, bump detail here is like the common uh, name for the money lender, uh, the loan shark and money lender, is still on every box, mostly in most box, which means that there. Uh, even though if they are saying that they are evil, they are not sustainable, you know, in, in reality they are still one of the uh, places they go if they need something. It's not the government, it's not the, it's the, it's the money lender. So their function is still there. And the other one is the, the air and airway is still in most box and also Rura, which means the importance of the local level institution on uh, poverty likelihood, uh, the, the likelihood of the poor. Because they are the gatekeeper for the people to access the social protection program. If you want something, if you want to go to the hospital without paying, you have to have the SKTN, Surat Keteran Tidak Mampu, and the document can only be made by the local official. So if the local official is not revitalized or is not working in some ways or the other, 
uh, the one that I was heard is the core. So this is also uh, also has to be in the agenda of the government to actually re revitalize this local level institution uh, because it's very 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 play an important role in uh, poor uh, livelihood. Now let's get go to a slightly higher level of the city spatial planning and poverty reduction. As you can see, there are in local government that there are local government actors and the private NGO and the central government uh, actors. So you can see that, well, uh, unsurprisingly actually, Babada, the, the, uh, the local uh, planning agency still plays central on planning. Everything you go to Babada, every, I think there are some, what do you call it, knowledge imbalances between Babada and the rest of the agency because they said that like Babada is like in the concentration of all uh, all knowledge, all information, while the other one is just like doing their job daily job. So so there should be like more uh, interconnection within Babada and the other. Take up the the local level poverty reduction coordination team yeah, has seen an increasing role, but because they are composed of the, the local government uh, official and also the NGO official. They sometimes doesn't get along and there's a conflict along the way. Uh, you know. Uh, there are still limited synchronization between BNPM and local government planning to Musa and Bang, which basically the BNPM have their own planning session while the Musa and Bang have their own planning session. So it's not synchronized, it goes their own way, it should be, uh, it should be more synchronized. But I think one Step has, take, bit has been taken in Solo and Makassar also on uh, synchronizing this. So something's been done for it. Donor agency have relatively limited role on planning. Uh, they're more focused on direct intervention, providing and providing information for local government. So uh, they usually advising, but they're not very very active on the planning process. <coughs> and the non-government actor has played more and more significant role on public reduction thanks to their TKPKD. So even though TKPKD is not working, but it's not working in its maximum extent, it actually helped the interaction between the, gov the government and the non-government, uh, the non-government organization. So actually, in some, in Solo, for example, one of the NGOs, Solo Kota Kita, actually is a key player in TKPKD. And they actually develops uh, a key and uh, interesting uh, poverty map, which is the poverty map in Kelurahan level. So basically in Kelurahan level, we have those kind of uh, social poverty map that we've seen before. So it's very helpful on planning, on and on giving information during the Musa and Bang forum and, and again. So, as we see that, and, and the first one, and during the start, we say that this research wants to see whether there are relations between special planning and property reduction. Well, they say the answer is uh, no, or, well, we say limited or weak connection between special planning. Why is that? Because, first, there are still limited awareness on spatial distribution of the poor. If you ask official, or even in Bapada, if you ask the official how many the poor or what is the poverty rate of the city, they can have readily available answer. But if you ask where the poor lives or what is the exact distribution of the poor in the city, well, uh, there are no official answer about that because they just treat, okay, the poor is the poor, <coughs> wherever, it is, wherever they are. And also, it's evident in the review of selected key, selected key planning document that there are limited integration. If you see the FAGMD, the medium term development planning, there are percentage of the poor, there are number of the poor, but they never put you know, the, the, the poverty map of the city, which is basically actually very important on uh, doing uh, resource allocation, strategizing on poverty reduction uh, program, so on and so forth. So 
This one is not being touched yet. So this one of one of our key advocacy points is that there should be. We, but and it's possible because now the poverty data in local level already by name by address. So actually they can map it out if they want to do it. It's not it's not that hard. They can do it, but whether they want to do it or not, that's a different question. Finding two. There is still tendency for escapism to see poverty reduction as a sector issue. So if you're talking uh, poverty, let's say, to the health agency, they say, oh, well, it's not our department. Go to Buckingham. Even though they know exactly if they, uh, many social programs under their, uh, uh, under their jurisdiction, but they don't see connection between their work and poverty reduction. And one of the examples is that uh, when we talk uh, in solo with market agency, uh, uh, Dinas Pasa, they say that uh, why come to us? We're not, we're having, we're nothing. We have nothing to do with poverty. But when after we, uh, well, we explain that uh, their role on uh, traditional market revitalization is very important on the poor livelihoods. They just begun to under, uh, make the connection. Oh yeah, well, in that so okay, we can talk. <laughs> so in that sort of kind of way. But, so poverty is just still sexual issues that uh, non other than the traditional agency is aware of. The other one is the poverty elimination initiative in both cities are still dominated heavily by programmatic approach. The program is the social protection program. Okay, I know it's important, but I think it's more attractive for them, for one of the incumbent of one of the wannabes to have a campaign saying that I will have this free education program rather than I will have the poor special urban planning program, pro poor special planning program. I mean, first it's abstract, two, it's not too attractive, while the programmatic approach is more easier to administer, uh, administer and it's more populist, seen as more populist, uh, and it's more attractive for the for the official. So this one also, uh, in the discussion with the non-government uh, actor, they also very much first, very well first on budget, budget advocacy and but limited understanding on special issues. There's still limited integration between the poverty document and the special document. At the every, if you see at the every of Makassar, you cannot find the word poor at all because it's not there. So the poor, the poor poverty reduction plan goes this way and the special planning goes the other way. It doesn't match up. Also the same with the poverty reduction planning. They doesn't even mention about the, the special condition of the poverty. So after all those analysis, this is the, uh, let's say the roundup the policy implication, what, how this implica what is the implication of all that into the policy. So as you can see that in special poverty aspect in settlement area, the inner city has to deal with slum upgrading, fire hazard mitigation, easily accessible land certification, but on the coastal it goes to more flood mitigation, and also in some instances if the area is very, very dangerous, uh, relocation is the is the options, but relocation is very very should be you know taken seriously because it's seriously destroy the livelihood if it's not done properly because it's actually ch uh, change people livelihood and if you don't give them option they just make it worse yeah. in peri-urban area because now is the problem is urban sprawl because the city government apparently doesn't really put enough. Uh, attention to the peri-urban area, there are urban sprawl and the growth of illegal uh, subdivisions. And this should be taken into account through land control. And they also have also the master plan of the settlement area in the peri-urban area. In water sanitation, as we can see in our city, they need sanitation, 
system that are space efficient because they don't have much land anymore. In coastal and river bank, uh, clean water piping, or if there is not available, artesian water source, the artesian well. But if that's not sustainable, also there should be another policy. But traditionally, uh, areas on the coastal area is having lower access to clean water. Also, water supply for public toilets. Yeah, in Makassar they have the toilet, but there's no, they have no water, so people still go to the sea to do their business. And very urban, the garbage disposal systems. Uh, it's very necessary because in very urban, in some illegal subdivision, no one takes trash. They have to uh, they have to pay for individual trucks to take the trash. Uh, if, if they don't do that, the trash will just keep piling up. Status of land ownership also. In inner city, land formalization is, uh, is, is important. Easily accessible certification for undisputed land uh, can help the poor so much, just like, uh, remember, uh, Muhammad Yunus did in Bangladesh, they started land certification. Uh, coastal river bank, uh, above the, in Makassar, there are actually some some houses on the stilts above the water, that should be done, something about it, because they don't have certification and the government doesn't have any attitude towards them. They don't prohibit, they don't uh, allow it, so we just leave them dry like that. And uh, in the future development, they don't have any certainty. So this should be dealt with. And per urban land cover policy, land services, and cheap land price housing guide. Uh, cheap land uh, for the low-end formal labor. They have, they actually have some resources to uh, rent uh, places, but uh, it should be affordable. Economic integration of urban poor sustainable uh, to sustainable economic opportunity. For inner city, they have access to uh, economic opportunities, but they need more skill, so they have more option. Uh, so, reskilling is one of the options, policy options that we can see here. Labor certification also improves access to the farming sector. In coastal area, there should be a revitalization of shorelines, but this also came with the note that uh, it's the, it is a question whether it is sustainable to have a fishery in urban area, because the urban area uh, let's see that in this in this uh, coastal area here is still they still have the fishery uh, industry, but here is the docks, the port, and everything. So it actually is in the long term it might not be sustainable. So options should be made uh, whether we have we give them alternatives for risk drilling so they can go into they can make a lifelong transition or. The other option is hard, but something has to be done about it soon. Because in, Erte, in Makassar, Erte Airway, all of the coastal area will be a part in the future. So there will be surely be relegated. There will be surely be no more fisheries in Makassar. That's, that's done. That, that's what's going to be in the future. So the uh, government should start thinking about how what are we going to do with this fishery? Uh, fishermen uh, who still don't have any likelihood option besides fishing. In very urban area, for developed public transportation and social protection systems for low and for low workers in Makassar. So here we go. Uh, oh yeah. Well, you can see this. The more uh, comprehensive uh, version of this in the policy brief that we handed up to you. Uh, you can, uh, the, so the uh, key recommendation is that the uh, future pro urban public program should based on spatial definition as we saw see, as we already seen that the spatial poverty context play a really, really significant issue on shaping the vulnerability and asset condition of the poor. So if you want to help the poor, you have to understand what they're dealing with and how the context really actually uh, shapes their, that condition. More comprehensive poverty data management, especially the one that already integrated the spatial poverty system. It's not hard, 
and it's not especially expensive. And even though you don't say that we don't have the know-how, you can always go to the third party. In, in solo case, for example, uh, the one that made all the Kalurahan uh, level property map is the NGO. And the NGO is sharing them with the local government. So <coughs> partnership is a very strategic, strategic uh, option here to do this. Uh, current social protection program schemes should take account of actual livelihood condition of the poor, like the one that the transaction cost now is actually outweighs the the services cost. That should be done about it. How is that a uh, transportation discount for the poor say, scheme, or the other uh, 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 or the for the school program, the targeted uh, to a program that also offers the school uniform, the one, uh, they are the some, but we should, they should expand it uh, in such a way so more people can get it. Increasing for access to more sustainable financial institution, as I called before, and more comprehensive evaluation assessment system for pre and post program. And this is also important <clears throat> because in the case of solo, they actually move people street vendor, is, uh, the street vendor into the traditional market, but they haven't made any follow up on how the sales goes, because people and some uh, some anecdotal evidence says that they actually the, the sales is actually lower when they are put in concentrated area like that because the access and uh, many many are variable. So uh, they say that maybe it's good on the surface that they made it more uh, organized, but in terms of the businesses, it's actually uh, lower. So people get just get back to the street uh, again. There is need a revitalization of participatory planning system and institutional strengthening of the Kapegade. Well, the Kapegade still have a lot of challenge, but it works. Uh, still necessary and it uh, have a good impact on poverty uh, reduction and bridging the actors in local level. So yeah, the future challenge will be to inform the key special planning actors, uh, building concrete and practical reference on what is actually a pro for city spatial planning. This is the key because uh, until now I don't think there are readily available information on how make the city more pro poor. Uh, this uh, this it will be the options for the donors. Maybe if they can make a focus on this, it will be great because there are no intervention on that until now. And yeah, follow closely the implementation of the airway and the impact of poor condition and reduction. With that, I uh, wrap up my presentation and <coughs> thank you. Maybe. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Yeah, because uh, yes, we know that um, the government has so many uh, planning documents. I just uh, wonder, uh, I, I couldn't imagine how could they interconnect all of the kind of documents and now incorporating the urban poverty issues in the spatial planning, I think it's Another it thing, another thing. Yeah, it will be a challenge. Okay. Um, it's 11:20 already. Means that we still have uh, 40 minutes for question and answer session. Uh, okay, for this session, we would like to receive three questions at a time. So you're please to write your question. Uh, you will part? Yeah. Please introduce yourself in life. <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm you part from UNICEF. Thank you. It was a very good presentation and very uh, relevant findings. I will also for sure share with my colleagues, especially those who are working in Solo and in Makassar. Um, in all your studies, you never heard reference to the child-friendly city concept? Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> But yeah, I think we got I think in Solo, I think, yes. Yes, because it's yeah. a champion yes. of the uh, Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection. Yes. Solo is kind of the vanguard on child friendly city concept, and the idea is that it is 
aim to reduce vulnerability among children, has a number of criteria, etc. So I would be interested to know if at yeah. all it was relevant to discussions on poverty in the urban area. Thank you. Thank you, Vinalpar. Any other comment or question? Yeah. Uh, <laughs>
also the playing role in the political aspect oh, yeah. in, in yeah. the elections and also in this land uh, uh, settlements. Uh, no, no. Uh, upgrading. upgrading. So, so you might add that. Yeah. I just want to add yeah. that. Okay, that's a, I think that's a very good uh, information. Yeah. Maybe, you know. But one, one, one thing about Makassar, because in Makassar, there are a lot of patch of land that are, and no one knows who has it. So basically, people just say it's owned by Kala, Haji Kala, Haji Kala, and it's just like Haji Kala. So, uh, yeah, well, that's, that's also a problem. Because, like, as we say, like, uh, the, the one in, the one in Barabara Bara Utara, this, this area, the one that our anyone that, uh, ex animal slaughterers, actually no one knows exactly who owns it. So, in this respect, I mean, like, if governments really want it, I mean, they can actually start to do an inventory on uh, taking this land and then make a public announcement, you know, you have to re-register this land and you have to claim it. If not, then uh, the government will take it and we will uh, formalize it and give it to the court for, you know, like, uh, service it and gives them properly to, to the to the poor. So that's one option. But I mean like uh, we also have a connection with uh Marfidu, uh Kupas. Have you have you ever heard the Kupas? Yeah but well, that's one of the NGO. But as we see that the NGO is more have more concern on like political uh, budgetary and programmatic uh, approach but uh, not many uh, have touched on the special uh, aspects of uh, city planning. So that's, that's the um, uh, you know, our, uh, questions. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think we came across that program but uh, we I think and we have some information about it. I think one of them are the crossings uh, near the school. I think now in front of the school they are dedicated a uh, red light that are just like in Singapore, you can press it and then so it's fail safe, so it, it makes uh, uh, the children better. But uh, I don't know. I mean, like maybe it's it's still in the uh, uh, it's in the pilot area, but in our area, in our study area, we haven't came across that program. Maybe maybe we maybe they don't know whether they actually maybe they already actually uh, benefits from it, but you know they don't. But I think it's a very very uh, I think I think Solo is one of the champions. I think one of the first, yeah. Yes. One of the first in Canada. And also I agree actually on focusing also on uh, children because as we can see that children is actually the one that are most affected by the urban poor because even the context of this organization of the, uh, the, the urban poverty, the, the deprivation they face every day in urban poverty is actually very, very high. And I think uh, UNICEF has already put that on the urban, as uh, child in urban, child poverty, child poverty in urban context uh, in your latest report, and I, I read it, it's very good. So, yeah, uh, that's, that's getting into the agenda right now. And we, and we basically various, we see various evidence on how those should be also the focus on the property reduction effort. Uh, uh, on, yeah, on to Highland. Yeah, in this uh, research because uh, we have to admit that we use the uh, FGD's uh, uh, method right here, right? And we actually ask them, uh, we, uh, we invite them to discuss in groups. So the details such as migrant and we, have, we actually uh, separated in the male group and the female group, we, we've done that. 
and we, I, we can talk about that later on. But on the migrant side, on ethnic, et, some, in some instances there are also ethnicity uh, right. issues, right? Yeah. It, that hasn't been touched really well through this method. Maybe that should be a uh, focus, uh, more focused uh, direction to actually really see the problem there. It, it, it's very important after all. I mean, like in, I think it, in, uh, in Jakarta, I've, I've done research on the poor Chinese, which as a, basically they are uh, suffering double uh, exclusion. First of being poor and second being Chinese. And they are very, a very profound uh, attitude even goes up to the government official that thinks that Chinese must be rich. So basically, uh, whenever they try to access the government program, no one's really accommodating them. So that's, that's one of the, and I think, I believe that it happened also in Makassar and in Solo, but I, but frankly, we haven't looked at but thank you for the, uh, raising a very proud point on that one. On women on the other side, we, uh, uh, we, we see that the vulnerability can be seen as born, uh, this, the spatial vulnerability is born by all. I mean, like if, 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 if there's flood or uh, infection or fire, then everyone's affected. But on navigating the vulnerability, I think the house, uh, the housewife plays the most role on it. Uh, uh, in one of the uh, discussion on institutions, uh, we can see that the the male doesn't uh, really point out about the informal money lenders and stuff because they're not the one who borrows. There are some values in in in, in the in the re yeah I, I I don't think it's exclusively in the research area but I think it's also in every other area that the man should not be the one who borrows because they have to you know keep the prestige and all. so the one that are usually uh, asked to go borrow and then figuring out how to return it is the is the female and it's also even though, if, even if they already have the, the money, they have to one still. They have to one who have to uh, manage it. So, and like one said in one discussion, saying that it doesn't matter how much the husband gives to us, it has to be, it, it have to be enough for one month. It, it doesn't matter. And I don't know. In some in some instances, they actually succeed. And, I don't know how. I mean, like, like, look, five, like, three hundred, three hundred thousand a month, and uh, they, and she still can send uh, her son goes to school. I mean, like, I mean, like, it's uh, quite uh, an achievement. So, uh, in that way, I mean, like, there are disproportionate burden on uh, vulnerability you know, between the male and the female, and also. Uh, the female also still, one of the main problems for the female also is that the clinician takes them, I mean, uh, they are still high fertility rate, which actually really compounds on the, uh, the female uh, housewife, because in some instances they, they say that uh, they want, they don't want any more child, I mean, like it's already a man as it is, but you know, uh, I think the uh, contraception, there are many factors about it, but I think also contraception, the awareness on doing how doing things properly is not uh, granted. So, yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, but even so, I mean, there should be more to it that, that meets the eye. And, but uh, because we are more focused on the institutional uh, uh, arrangement and also the planning, special stuff, so we haven't done that. But that will be very interesting. Yeah. Uh, have you satisfied you know, with the answer from Rio? Yes. Okay. Ibu Diana, would you like to add some more? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I was interested in, in your policy implications, in your recommendations on policy implications on special public leadership planning when you I don't know, maybe I've misheard that you said the 
about the coastal areas revitalization and climate and transition adjustment assistance. Uh, um, I don't know. I I when I heard that I'm quite surprised that uh, you uh, you were saying that the system was supposed to be in the urban areas. I mean, like we know that in Indonesia now this every provinces every cities now having this water reclamation project and we do know also that uh, it is due to the low number 27-2007 that uh, some of, of uh, NGOs have the judicial reviews and the constitutional court actually uh, approved the, the judicial reviews for articles about uh, the ownerships of the private or the small islands and, uh, and the coastal areas for private so uh, we, uh, this NGO is also, I personally believe that uh, that there should be uh, at least small partial of urban areas that, that are uh, dedicated to these people, to the fishermen. I mean like, uh, when you, you, you also argue that in our special planning, in our at, at the airway, there is no uh, clear uh, places for these poor people. But we, I, I see that it is actually on the on the coastal areas that these people are at, I mean, aside the inner cities and the river banks and all the slums and all the illegal clubs, but uh, they are also living in these coastal areas. But and but if you are uh, considering to give this uh, recommendation saying that they shouldn't live in urban areas, so but like in Makassar, these people are Bugis, right? And yes. Bugis people are known to as a cloud. Yeah, sure. yeah, so they are actually born to be a, a sailor man like Popeye, so I don't know whether, <laughs> you know, whether it is, it, is, it, uh, is it the right uh, recommendations uh, considering that Indonesia has so many other uh, uh, sea and uh, I mean the size of the sea is, uh, is, is greater than the land, so uh, I, I personally do not actually agree with this recommendations project saying that we need more land and then just to and preventing the uh, discussion to, to fish in the urban areas and others. Okay. But uh, thank you very much. Actually, a very, very uh, valid and fair point, actually. And I, when, I, when we wrote this, we actually already do it in a very, very, uh, as I said before, this is very hard, but this has to be dealt with. But here's the thing. Uh, the, there are two of it. Whether it's, it sounds evil, it should be also in the policy table. I mean, like there are no option about it because the coastal area now is actually uh, overfished now because the population of the fishermen are increasing, while the sustainability of the uh, the coastal area, the coastal uh, the ecosystem, is no longer can, can no longer support that much uh, fishing. So the one that we advocate here is that we give some of them, not all of them, some of them, an option to have a livelihood transition. So maybe in the future, in, in this in this point, uh, I can say. Frankly, I don't know uh, on how this can play out in the future because uh, we've seen the MTN way uh, design and we can see that the whole area of the Talo, Kerahan Talo, will no longer be there. It will be, uh, it will be uh, replaced by, I think, huge docks or port complexes. And we're still looking for that. We, we've asked uh, to the city government, and they say that, well, uh, we still, we also do that. Uh, we still haven't had an idea about it yet. So, uh, but I think you, you, you raised a very valid point, but uh, in, in, in this, in this, in this uh, aspect, uh, the livelihood transition is something that are regrettable, but it's, sometimes unavoidable, we have to do something about it because uh, otherwise when, if, if the area is actually flattened or actually uh, whether they, if, even if they are still have a uh, fishing village there but 
the shoreline next one is already become a dock or a port, the ecosystem will no longer be suitable for fishery uh, altogether uh, anyway. So uh, it, either we can you know, look forward, uh, we have to do something about it. Well, in one of the options is the uh, life transition uh, adjustment system. And I'm not never, I mean, like, I have forget the relocation, but I put a star in it <laughs> with, uh, before that relocation should be the last, uh, yeah, last option because it's very detrimental. But uh, it's, yeah, it's very, very uh, sad, but uh, that's the reality that we face now. And it's very, very uh, pressing issues for the Mapasa the government because they have a large patch of land there and substantial area of those uh, shoreline is still uh, served as the fishing village and what they want to do about it because they, they have to do about it soon because it will uh, otherwise the more uncertainty they face the, the, term, the more detrimental it's going to be for them but I agree with you I mean I agree with you yeah. oh, sorry. Oh. He just a quick comment. Uh, <laughs> you're saying that uh, thinking of a bigger stone, thank you, means you never throw it. So I'm glad this discussion came up because I was just wondering, yes, it's the government duty to do this, it's the government responsibility to come up with a solution and all the rest. And I was wondering what will be the role of people here and what will be the value we have for their empowerment and uh, considering them in yeah. the future. And I think uh, what you explained, you know, gave me a relief because uh, I think people also in the meantime while government is doing something yeah. have uh, the right to have option. Yes. And that is why I'm thinking this part of the yeah. comment that people made, uh, what you suggested is very worthwhile from that perspective that uh, there should be opportunity for those who don't want to follow the fisherman's life yeah. for the rest of their life. And that's where other options perhaps can be accepted. Thank you. 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 Uh, I think uh, it's already clear. Uh, shall we continue for another question? Three more questions? Maybe from Bapa uh, Bapa. <laughs> because we have already knew before. Babudi. Babudi, yeah. Uh, I'm Babudi from Indonesia. Uh, I'm very interested in the fishery and 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 a uh, plan um, decide to to final garbage disposal. Sometimes they have to make agreement with the uh, area uh, borders uh, the city. So uh, did you uh, did you uh, uh, did you know about the the planning about this system? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Akhir? Thank you, uh, I have to thank Bapa Bapa from Mumbai. Congratulations coming from Ibu-Ibu. So, so well, congratulations to Priyo. It's a very excellent presentation. Uh, secondly, uh, Brilliant presentation, but this study is an exploratory study. Oh, yeah. So, being an exploratory study, I think the, the achievement of this study is very uh, more than we expect from the beginning. So, congratulations also for the team. Uh, having said that, I would like to stretch further uh, the findings from your study uh, relating to your last slide about proper city planning. I think 
Uh, I want something uh, more clear from you about this concept uh, of positive planning. Uh, do we anticipate uh, a city planning which facilitates the poor to continue their life uh, easier than used to be? They can access air, facilities, they can access education, they can access transportation, doing etc. But they remain poor for the rest of their life. Or do we want something which is more transformative? Uh, it's not just uh, making life for the easier, but also help them to move out of poverty. After all, our uh, ultimate objective is poverty reduction. So, from the whole presentation, I haven't seen really a connection yeah, from, from the city planning to poverty reduction, even though we criticize that there's no link, but the conceptual uh, understanding is about how city planning can help the poor to move out of public, how it can be done, it's not that clear yet, I think. Yeah. That's what I'm from uh, one more question. Uh, either from Ibu or Bapak. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think. Yeah. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah, uh, on a garbage disposal system. I think uh, uh, in Solo, as we know it, that the, the the final dump site is on the peri-urban area of Media Song. It's one of the uh, study sites actually, and it serves as one of the center point of like it because one of the uh, many scavengers uh, make a living out of there. But I think if, if it's the problem, then the problem goes more on Makassar case, because I think Makassar now is in the, they are battling with the, uh, uh, neighboring, uh, neighboring region, yeah, neighboring district. I think it's, um, I think it's Maros, yeah. I think they are now in, a, I think in discussion or I think it's gone up to a fight with Maros about the access to final dump site because I think the final dump site will not be on the Makassar, but they will be on Maros. Uh, the rationale of the the rationale of the Makassar is because they already have the Mami Nasata framework. Maros at Makassar Maros Kaya Sumi Nasa. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a okay. collection of uh, regions around right there. <laughs> so basically, they they say that okay, Makassar is the center point <laughs> it can have access or should have access to have garbage, uh, uh, to have a dump site outside the Makassar border. While the Mara say that, wait, wait, there are no clear plan on this uh, framework and you already want to put your garbage in our uh, region. So there's still no battle about that. And that's also a problem on, on, on it. Uh, but mostly on the problem on garbage disposal system is that the garbage disposal system on, in Makassar, the one that we know of, is very, very slow to expand. Uh, uh, Makassar itself is uh, uh, expanding quite rapidly and there are more and more settlements and more population centers around the peri-urban area but the, the expansion of the, dump, uh, the, the garbage disposal service is uh, very, very uh, low. There is actually quite an interesting story about these issues in Makassar. This one, uh, Discovered, discovered by our colleague Just, Justin when he, when he uh, doing an interview with a guy from the uh, cleaning services in Nascimbasia and he said that uh, uh, disposal or garbage service in uh, Makassar is held by one is held by one clan I don't know if it's clan or one family or something so it's already like uh, monopolized by that uh, by that family or some sort of so well, by that group. So the expansion is not easy because they're traditionally always been the one who uh, 
uh, dealing with uh, garbage disposal. And the government, I think because these families have strong ties or something, they don't really have a power to do something about it. So this is also a problem, underlying problem in Mukasa. But I'm not really sure about in uh, Solo, I mean, I don't, I, I don't see uh, quite, uh, quite a uh, problem in Solo as much as Mukasa. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so it's quite a side, a side story in uh, our research. Uh, credits to Justin, to Justin, where he can uh, appears to find an interesting, interesting story in every story. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, is it? Uh, is it clear, Or is it something? More? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, so go to the hard stuff. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think uh, you really punch uh, the part where it very hurts in this research that we actually still, uh, as we see that, we are still uh, looking for a concrete and practical reference concept of proper city spatial planning because I've done some research, desk research, on a similar study that but they don't have any uh, they don't have any uh, uh, framework like concrete framework yet I mean like I've I've, uh, I've came across some uh, policies uh, saying that land policies usually the uh, in the public policy discussion uh, today the in city planning means that efficient land market so basically uh, you cannot hold land for speculative purposes, you have to tax land that are not used, so people is discouraged to hoarding land which drives the uh, price up. But I think that are still, I think it's still lower in the uh, concept, the whole grand concept of proper city planning. And I think the one that you said is actually, uh, some, I think it's some kind of trade-off here. Because if we want to go for, say, say uh, poverty reduction to transformative uh, measures, that means an aggressive uh, uh, economic growth uh, strategy, which means we will, on those strategies, we, it will include also relocation of a strategic plan that is more suitable for business, but now employed as, say, fisherman village. <laughs> I mean, like the fisherman village uh, stands in, some fisherman village actually stand in the prime location of the city. It's actually uh, uh, in, a, in the areas that are suitable for, say, ports, for uh, warehouses, and so on and so forth. But if we want to pursue those transformative strategy, then it will also be on the table relocation, uh, well, uh, uh, land, uh, reclaiming land, and also the more aggressive land control issues. I mean, like, if you want more uh, people to go to the business center, you have to enforce that the uh, houses cannot be used as shops because it will uh, because it will uh, uh, hurt the sales of the bigger shops say. and in actually in some cities in some areas it's actually the there are a law provision on that you cannot use your house as a shop or as your business place but actually it will also uh, 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 it will also hurt the poor because house is the only place they can do business because they cannot rent they cannot Go anywhere. So that also, and also saying like, if we want to make a city that are more beautiful and are uh, uh, for tourist destination, we have to be more aggressive on street vendors, and we have to be more aggressive on the slums area, the illegal slums area, and so on and so forth. So I think this is a very, very uh, a valid, but a very, very uh, difficult 
policy trade-off, which one we will pursue. And if you ask me last I don't know what to ask. And I think this research uh, doesn't have enough information to have readily available answer to that. But what I see from this research, I think it's more on the other policy option, is keep, you know, uh, the poor, making them easier, their life easier, with the hope with making their life easier one day or somehow, someday, somewhat, they will escape poverty and... Uh, but I think one thing, one thing, uh, what we can do now is that we should make things easy for something that are not supposed to be hard. I mean, like the basic services, uh, uh, land prices. Land prices is ridiculous. I mean, like it's it's not there. It's not supposed to be that high, but because of the speculation and and, uh, and uh, the the inefficient uh, land market is, is going up there. And also, just basic services that's supposed to be there. Make it make sure it's there. I think that's that's one of the key point now. I mean, later on we have to address the, the asset uh, uh, trade-off, uh, the one that are more, uh, that are more uh, slower, or the one that are more radical and transformative. But that will come later on because the base itself hasn't been covered. So I think even that, I think the one that we can do, and we should start from there. No, we should put that as another recommendation for the study. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, any other question or comment? Maybe just on this point because yeah. it's important to find it. Well, I think recommendations linked to strengthening the accessibility of quality of health services for the poor, education services for the poor, and social protection programs for the poor poor itself is done in a substantive quality way with the right approach and targeting, etc., can break the cycle of exactly. intergenerational exactly. poverty. So I don't think, uh, as you mentioned, it's the aspect of uh, greater economic growth by, for example, having more uh, land development, etc. I think it's a bit even more basic than that. It's just exactly. improving accessibility of quality health, education, and social protection services, and you will already have uh, contributed exactly. to reduce the poverty rate. I, I agree. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's not exactly rocket science. I mean, like, we can think about fancy uh, city development uh, plan. Okay, maybe it's, maybe it's okay for Seoul or for Singapore, let's say, but I think in Indonesia we have to cover the basic first because it's, it's, it's but uh, what I mean is the basic is basic, but yet it's not basic exactly. because that basic can contribute yes. to breaking the intergenerational yes. cycle of poverty. Yes, I agree. Uh, is it clear enough, Igu? Yeah. Uh, is there any other question or comment? Error. Error. <laughs> 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 From Kajinta, <laughs> from Bapana, Bapa. Yeah, uh, I think it's already clear, and the time is up. Yeah, we finish the discussion now. Uh, hey, just to sum up, yeah, uh, from three presentation. Uh, you know that uh, Indonesia has now become more urbanized and urban the problem has grown substantially. Yeah, as mentioned by Brio, the share of urban poor is now increased by two fold uh, yeah from IT in seven nineteen seventies and to uh, thirty six more than thirty six percent in two thousand nine. Uh, well, clothes and the other uh, social problems, yet some other problems faced by the urban city 
accident. Um, you know. uh, but unfortunately, the existing city planning, uh, city spatial planning, has not yet enough incorporate uh, the social issues, especially the urban poverty issues. Uh, so uh, there is a need uh, not only from the government side, uh, but also uh, from us, the civil society, and all of the citizens to pay more attention to poverty problem as well as poverty reduction efforts in urban areas. Uh, of course, by incorporating uh, urban poverty issues into uh, spatial city planning. Yeah, and hopefully from uh, this urban poverty study, also from uh, about through this uh, discussion, this kind of discussion, we can not only increase our knowledge but also uh, our uh, and our awareness on this urban poverty issue, but also to uh, advocate and influence the decision maker. Uh, to be more incorporated the property in the spatial planning. Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, that's all from us. Uh, thank you for your, oh yeah, thank you for, line, uh, for your kind of attention and participation. Uh, and now uh, the most, <laughs> the most anticipated agenda uh, for today's discussion is uh, the lunch time. <laughs> We are going to start lunch uh, uh, there. There. So please help me out. Thank you very much.